Well, the White House pushed back its planned revision of President Trump's executive order blocking arrivals from temporarily from seven Muslim majority countries. White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer said this about that today. Watch. These were countries that we didn't have uh, the proper vetting for when it came to uh, ensuring the safety of Americans. Uh, that's what the executive order said. The authority is very clear to have him done it, and I think that you're going to continue to see the president take the steps necessary to protect this country. That's why he's talked about, you know, fighting this on both fronts, making sure that we keep evolving through the court system on the existing EO, and then looking towards the next draft of the executive order. Scott Arbeiter is the president of World Relief. It's a Christian organization. He's also a pastor, and the organization provides refugee resettlement services, among other things. The organization just had to close five offices and lay off 140 people, a development it blames directly on the executive order out of the White House, which drastically curtailed the number of refugees who might arrive here in the U.S. Scott Arbeiter joins us right here in the studio. Scott, thanks a lot for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tucker. So there are, according to the U.N., more than 60 million people displaced in the world mm -hmm. right now. How many is the U.S. morally obligated to bring here? I couldn't tell you what the moral obligation for the U.S. is. I think our history has been that we've been a compassionate people, and I think that every administration, along with uh, every legislature, has to decide what is that obligation at any particular point in time. I don't think I could put a number on what the moral obligation is. But I, but I think it should be... Uh, more than zero, and I think it should be uh, in some way connected to what is the tragedy that the world is facing right now, America being, I think, arguably the greatest country in the world with the greatest security, the greatest resources, and the greatest freedoms, is situated right in the middle of a world that is in the worst refugee crisis ever. So uh, the president has said, and, and I applaud for this, he wants to make America great. And I think the question for us is, what does great look like when you have those resources, those freedoms, and you have that tragedy? Can we be so great as to hold both security and compassion okay. together? I, I think that's all fair. I mean, I, I would argue that our country is a lot less affluent than people think it is. And, and actually, we're not the richest country. We don't have the most resources. But leaving that aside, you, you can see why people would get uncomfortable. And I think your motives are good. But when you say things like, well, we're a good country. We have an obligation. It's more than zero. I mean, math plays a role in this. So what do you personally think would be a good number? 500,000 a year, 3 million a year? I mean, it's, this, these are I, physical people. You do this for a living. Like, what do you think is a good number? Yeah, I, I'll give you a personal opinion on that, Tucker. Yeah. I would say that if we were looking at about 1%, because you've got about 21 million refugees. And let's remember, these are traumatized people running from the very enemies we're rightly trying to defeat. They've been bombed out of their homes. They're cold. They're hungry. They're unwanted any place. And you say, okay, do we have any compassion for these people? And if we do, then let's create a place where we can safely bring them in. We can hold safety and security together. I would say out of the 21 million, if we could bring in 1%, and right now we're aiming at two-tenths of 1%, I think we, we can do, we can be great in for how compassion long? and for how long? Over what period? Is that a, a, I think, an obligation that just exists forever? No, no. I think because we've watched the, the nation has responded to different periods of time in different ways. And we don't have the moral authority to dictate what that is. But we are calling for a greater level of compassion when you take a look at just how tragic these circumstances are and the quality of the work we can do if we're great in both our vetting and in our compassion. I, here's what I understand. And again, I think your compassion is real, and I applaud it. And I think it is a Christian's duty to be compassionate. I don't think it's the U.S. government's duty to be compassionate. It's its, it's duty to protect its citizens and, to the extent possible, ensure their prosperity. Well, I think and the I think, government has decided to do both for many years. But why, why are you taking any government money? You take tens of millions of dollars from the government, and as a Christian organization, doing what you see as your Christian duty, why should taxpayers subsidize that? Well, you know, it's, it's a good question, and it's interesting because the people that have been uh, critics of ours for taking any money now to help in refugee resettlement, by the way, that's not new. We've been doing it for seven presidential administrations right. since Reagan. So it's been an American value for 40 years through multiple administrations, not new for us or for the American people to do that. But when we have helped the government resettle suffering people because they said, you know, the public-private partnership works. It's better when communities and churches are a part of this. I think people have asked, uh, have expected that we would be either defensive or embarrassed about taking government money. We're actually proud that we do this work so well using so many volunteers, 
thousands of churches, tens of thousands of people to help the government accomplish what it decided to do. We, we well, never wait a second, but you say on your, and I get that, but you say on your website you're doing this because it's biblical, you're doing it out of your Christian faith, which for yeah. the third time I respect. But how is it consistent with your Christian faith to give away something that doesn't belong to you, which is to say the country or tax dollars? If you're doing this out of Christian faith, why not pay for it? Well, here we we are, but here's here's what. But the you're not. I mean, you, you well, took forty-two million dollars in government money last well, year. Well, that, that's not right. I mean, it's close, but but well, that's what your it is. Your tax it is form both. Says. It is both. The U.S. government makes a decision about resettling refugees. Let's be clear: no refugee gets to pick to come to the United States. They only come if invited by the State Department. World Relief doesn't invite them. We don't pick them. We don't vet them. We don't even know who they are until the State Department hands us the file and says. We have chosen to resettle these refugees. Right. It's a government decision. And when the government decides to do that, they're coming at us and saying, would you help us then integrate right. but you're, these But people? you're not answering my question exactly. So you're doing this as a Christian because you think it's your Christian duty, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Then why wouldn't your duty be to actually go all the way and pay for it? Why is it noble as well, a Christian to force other people to pay for your Christian duty? That's what I don't understand. Yeah, we're doing both, Tucker, and here's why. The U.S. government, because they decided to resettle refugees, said it's only helpful to resettle refugees if they can integrate into a community. So they, the government gives about $1,100 per person for a 90-day period. and. They also then help us build the volunteer pools by which we serve over the years. Okay. We do that. But let me finish. Many churches and many individuals and foundations also pay for that work. The government isn't paying for all that work. We've well, got a vast forty two million dollars, not including the cost to educate these people and their children and to pay for their health care, which the US government yeah. does you do not do pay for the infrastructure they use. I mean, it's a massive cost to the taxpayer. And I would just take Christians more seriously if they said, I have a Christian duty to do this. I'm going to go to Syria and help people there, or maybe bring them here and educate them myself, have them live in my home, and we pay can't. the whole freight. We can't. We can't. We, first of all, we do go to Syria. We're in five Middle East countries. We think we ought to care over there and care over here as well. We can't resettle a refugee and pay for it because the government can only, only the U.S. State Department decides if a refugee comes. Oh, but you could. So the refugee could come here and you could say, this is a Christian home into which you will now go. You will live there and they're going to carry the costs of keeping you here as you get on your feet. And instead you offload those costs onto the U.S. taxpayer and call yourself virtuous. What That's the problem I what, have. What you're missing, Tucker, is it's a public-private partnership that many of our critics lauded us for when we were accepting money from the George W. Bush uh, administration to help combat HIV AIDS around the world through the churches. Public-private partnership. The government brings a part of it, and we bring an amazing group of people in a volunteer I'm network. I'm not saying you don't do a good job. And, I'm and just saying, continue, how do you call it Christian if you're not paying for it? And we continue to, to do that work, and we pay for it long after the government is no longer involved in their lives. We're there. Do you pay for the education of the refugees who come? No. Do you but pay for again, their health care? No, but again, that is a government oh, I decision. <laughs> I, mean, like, I pay taxes too. I know you I do, do, but I'm pe people who don't agree with the policy are forced to pay for it, and you take the moral credit for it. That's that's what. I, that's we the problem. We are not taking any moral credit for this. We wouldn't be in here having this conversation. We quietly go about this work because we're trying to take seriously Jesus's command: do to others what you would want to have done to you. But there was no part about get $42 million from the government in Jesus' command. Well, I will tell you that um, if, if you're concerned about the amount of money and what it does, our average staff person in the U.S. who does this work, amazing people, I'm so proud of, their average salary is about $10,000 a year do, less than an assistant I don't think you're Walmart. doing it to get rich. I'm not saying that for a second. I'm sure okay, every person who works for you is doing it. Out there. I don't think that. It's obviously not true. I think you're doing it because you think it's your duty. But again, yeah. my point... I've restated it, you clearly disagree, is that when you have a duty to do something because you think God wants you to do it, you should accept the entire responsibility and not offload it onto the unwilling, i.e. taxpayers. Yeah. I think the government has a right to make a decision about who they're going to bring in. We don't have that right. And as long as they've decided to do that and they've said, we want to participate in that by doing it well, we need partners, that public-private partnership is something we're actually proud of, not embarrassed okay. by. Scott, thanks a lot for explaining that. appreciate it. Thank you, Tucker.